There ain't nothing particularly noteworthy about the building sitting in the middle of the park there. I guess it's supposed to be a stage or a miniature amphitheater. It of itself ain't creepy, it's just, I don't know, kind of big porch thing with a roof on it. What's creepy about it is the back. They publicized a disappearance from here once, made some X-Files knockoff movie about it, you know. The guy who got abducted by aliens in the White Mountains in the 70s. And the movie came along at the end of that fad, so it's not really a surprise. If you haven't heard about it, don't remember it or anything. So, Walton wasn't the only person to go missing. Well, he was the only one to come back. Which is why everyone thinks he's full of shit. At the back of the building is this monument to all the people who have disappeared from this town. Everyone does this thing where they go and they hang up outfits, the whole deal. Like someone's still wearing them. And... And they pin him there. Probably 30 or so sets of pants and shirts and stuff stuck to the back of this thing. Mostly little kids' clothes. And in case I have to spell it out for you, that's like 30 people who have straight vanished from this place. Started before Walton. No one said anything about aliens until he came back. No one's really said anything about aliens since, I guess. I mean, he says, he says it all the time, but whatever. So we get this call out to do this job, my dad and I. It was one of those days, gray skies, windy, air was heavy like, like it wanted to rain but couldn't. It looked like a septic sinkhole had started to open up underneath the amphitheater. Ain't no septic tank there, but alright. Big pits were spreading out underneath the right side of the stage and the whole floor had a thin crack running through it. The foundation had shifted, the town council wanted to prevent any more damage from happening. There was a single hole starting to show up around the back. And we had measuring rods. We were sticking them down into the sludge at the bottom to see how deep they went and how much clay we'd have to use to fill them in. Well, Dad gets to prod the main hole. I go around the back, the little one, back by the kind of morbid display of everyone gone. And the hole's right underneath these blue track pants and yellow soccer jersey. Probably from a kid no more than eight years old. His little vans were, his little vans are stapled up to the wall. So, I get to stick down there into all of it. It goes real deep. There's no firm resistance. Sitting back trying to figure out how I can get an extra arm's length down when my dad starts howling like the devil himself got him. I come running around the front and he's got his flashlight shining down in the hole. He's damn near got his whole head underneath the lip of the stage. These kind of sinkholes are dangerous. You know, like The ground you're standing on can just shift under you and that's it. You just be gone. Muck down there will swallow you up. So my dad's the smartest guy I know, and there's no way he'd be putting himself into a position without a good reason. He looks up at me. He's pale white. He says, get over here. He shows his whole shoulder underneath the foundation, trying to get this light under there. He's not afraid. But something's got him real upset. So I give the ground a wide pass around him and go to the other side of the hole. It's dark inside. And what his light shows isn't much more than the gray-brown stuff that I can see on the other side. There's a kid down there. Can you see him? Dad says. As I got older, I realized that my pop didn't know everything. But when he tells me something, my first instinct is to believe it, even if it doesn't make sense. So I do the dangerous thing. I try to get my head under the stage too, but I don't see anything. It smells human down here, but not like, not like sewage. More like moss growing on a tree. Where? I ask him. Hole's pretty big, despite the fact that the opening is only about two or three feet wide. Uh, it don't look like it connects to the one around the back. I don't know. I just saw him. I sit up and I fish around in my pocket for my phone. Oh, we got to call somebody. Get your light over here, he tells me. So instead of doing the smart thing, getting someone out there to help or an ambulance or something, I just do what he says. Get mine under there, too. I don't really see much other than more of a slimy soil. He pulls himself out for a second, comes back with a pole in the other hand. He's got nothing to stabilize himself with now. Bad news. He goes, put it over there, and shows me with his light where he wants mine. He starts waving the pole around and plunges the end of it down into the standing water at the very bottom. Sure enough, a little white hand comes up when he lifts it back up. I got him there, he says. His face is starting to turn red. He tells me to 
hold my light steady. The little hand is just, just hanging there, limply by the wrist. He flings his light out behind him and grabs the pole with his other hand. The leverage is too much. He's not strong enough to hold on to it. Go get the other one, he tells me. Maybe the two of us can lift him out. So I go for it. The whole time I'm thinking, maybe, maybe I ought to call someone. But who knows how much time this little guy has. It's back around the corner where I left my pole. I shit you not. I hear a giggle. There's two little kids standing on the other side where I left my things. So I tell them I need their help. I grab my pole, I tell them to run to the county building, cross the street. Kids are pale as fuck, you know, but that doesn't compute right away. Dad's still half gone underneath the building when I get back. He looks looks like he's scooched sideways, trying to wedge his hip in there, and the ground still comes up against the foundation of the building. Hopefully it doesn't crumble underneath him. I climb in on the other side of the sinkhole again, I get the pole down there, trying to balance it with the flashlight in the other hand. I shine the light on Dad, down his arm and down the pole, and the little wrist is still resting over it. The little hand looks... looks kind of blue. Careful, he says. Doesn't want me to stick the kid or anything. But I gotta at least find out where he is so I can get my pole underneath him. It's a tricky thing looking for the right kind of firmness in a mass like that. You get stopped up all the time in the muck. But you know the difference between that slowing you down and when it hits something solid like, like ground? Or a body. I got him, I tell Dad. Well, hurry up! A couple more gentle prods into the solid mass and I feel something. It's feedback, maybe. It's hard to keep the light steady and I pull my pole back some and there's a little fist grasp in the end of it. The little bastard's alive. So I start to feel some of the worry in my dad's voice. We're on a timer and those kids out back were kind of worthless. See, nobody ever showed up to help us. I don't want to pull too hard because I don't want the little guy to lose his grip. But what if he's really stuck down there? I mean, how long, how long has he been under? Why isn't he grabbing dad's pole too? My light catches a little bit of his arm as I pull up a bit, but I have to reposition myself. I find the end of dad's pole and I find the end of my pole and some eyes reflect back at us. He's got his head above the water. The dad makes a noise. When I look back at what I'm lighting up, the kid's other hand is gripping dad's pole. My first thought is, great, kid. Now, hold on while we drag you out. But then... But then, then I notice his eyes. They're black. Not like... But not lights off black. They're like... They're black like the insides of a marble. Like a, like a black that goes inward. Sort of like when you're staring up at the sky at night and... That black goes somewhere. I don't know if because it was so dark in there. And my flashlight sucks, but we needed to get this guy out. And that's all I could really think about. That's when Dad calls me by name. He says, John. Like, real calm, like. And I thought something was wrong. I only ever heard him say it one other time like that. And I wasn't much older than this kid down here. And there was a bear in the woods with us. He says, flip your light up. In that same tone. There's two, three, four more sets of those black eyes shining back at us. These kids are pasty, too. And that's when I put two and two together, and I realized those ones around the back was off. Dad goes, there's so many of them, how the hell did they get down here? And I hear him wiggling. Now something's wrong here, and I, I can feel it in my gut. Dad says, we gotta get him out of there. I shine my light back on them. There's more. Like, like a lot more. Dad, I says, but I still hear him wiggling around over there, and I can hear a, a bit of dry soil falling into the water below us. When I put my light back on him, he's trying to scoot further in to get the pole all the way down to those kids. He's gonna fall in. He knows better than that. I put my light back on the kids one more time, and they've all started to go for his pole. Saw a bunch of rats swimming once. That's what they looked like. He can't pull them all out, not by himself. These kids, I mean, what are they going to do down there? I grab Dad's trousers back by the belt and hold on. It doesn't feel like the kids are tugging on him. It feels like he's trying to crawl the rest of the way in. Maybe hes he thinks that he can get in and get boots on the ground. He, maybe he could lift them up or something, but he can't be thinking straight. There's no way he could be sure that he'd have stable ground down there. He shimmies a bit further in, and the edge of the concrete pinches my hand, something fierce. I had to let go, but then... Then his whole butt's inside, and he's only clinging by bending one knee up around the platform. I let go of my pole, but I can't I can't reach him with my free hand, so I start backing my way out. 
I ask him what he's doing, but all he says is, we gotta get him out, son. I get all the way out and make to go across the hole and grab him when all those white faces are right there at the edge of the hole. All right up where I just was, right up by his thighs. I, I can't move. Those, those eyes, those eyes are meant to swallow me up. He shifts his legs. He slides himself further into the hole. And then, and then he's just gone. And there's just this empty hole. No little kids, no dad, nothing. I stood there staring for a minute before I ran off to the sheriff. When he came back with a big flashlight and I couldn't see nothing, I wasn't getting near the hole again. They didn't see nothing. And the one round back, neither. Hit up every damn avenue available. I was just, I just kept in the same dead eyed stare. Deputies looking like they wanted to say something. But, and they just put their gear away, told me to go on home. I, I swear, I heard the paper say Walton. They were hanging up on me. Sheriff told me he'd file a report. Then I had a vision of 30 other reports all together in a nice three ring binder. Saw the mayor down at the skillet. Just he kept telling me he was sorry. See, the, the thing is, no, no one seemed surprised when I mentioned the kids. Like it wasn't a crazy thing at all. Just kept nodding, saying they were sorry. A couple days later, the county maybe just guess on the amount of clay they'd need to fill in the holes. They put more sod down on top. And that was that. It was like it never happened. And I, I could have grabbed his ankles, pulled him out. I could have done something. But I didn't. Mom and me went back the next week. Hung him a pair of his Wranglers. And a t-shirt. Around back of the building. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I just wanted to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video, or listening to tonight's episode of the podcast. It really helps me out whenever you guys do things like listen, or watch. And it really helps if you guys also subscribe to the podcast, or subscribe to the YouTube channel, or do things like clicking the bell, or clicking the like button. For those of you who are looking to actually talk to me live and not just listen to me on the podcast or the live stream or what have you, then you can actually head over to twitch.tv slash MrCreepyPasta, where I record a lot of these episodes that you see live. Also, it's just fun for me to be able to interact with you guys, and sometimes we do other fun games. And as always, I want to give a very special thank you to all of my supporters on Patreon. You guys are the ones who help me keep the lights on the house as well as allow me to do things like commission brand new stories. In case you guys haven't noticed, we hit that tier. So a very special thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Stricken, Chase Burnett, Deanna Kraus, G Weevil 3, Tristan Pelton, 1-800-Nightmare, Acid System, Aaron Stormcrow, Azarine Fox, Bobby Carmen, Chris Lovin, Cryptic Nightmares, The Doctor, Daniel Polson, Dr. Stein and Mr. Happy, Euro Gore, Freddy Krueger, Fried Chicken 12, Hades Nephew, Infertile One, James Bruce, James Lowe, Jason V.R. Wilson, Jimbo the Hutt, Jordan Nels, Jordan Johnson, Caleb Dougal, Kiri the Sloth, Legit Quad Feed, Liam Newman, Lisa Cottrell, Marco Takes Dabs 420, Michael Scarborough, Nico Kyle, Nina Smith, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Rafael Rodriguez, Robert White, S-Man, Sky Harbor, Snails Burnett, Talon Carlick, The Ginger Bros, Trace Miles, Suji Campbell, Tynany, Unknown Nobody, Andre Garcia, Brianna Wright, Brian Ace, Caspian, Hogunchi, and Someone You Love. And also a very special thank you to everybody who's down there in the description down below. Hello. All you guys who are listed as Patreons and everybody who's even supporting for just $1, I really love and appreciate you guys. And if you want to join them, you can always head over to patreon.com slash MrCreepyPasta. Even a dollar a month, honestly, it keeps the show going. So thank you guys so much. And to everyone out there, sweet dreams.